I understand the next call is a split call. I'll ring the bell at four minutes. The Honourable David Parker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was astounded to hear from the Attorney General in his, his uh, opening address in this debate to say that under this legislation there are no grey areas. No grey areas. It is just impossible to conclude that there are no grey areas left in this bill when you have the Privacy Commissioner, the Human Rights Commissioner and the Law Society all saying the opposite. I, I can't, can't see how the Attorney General can get to that position in the face of that clear advice. Mr Speaker, there is no doubt that this legislation widens the existing powers of the GCSB. There is no doubt that we need to have appropriate legislation for the GCSB. There is no doubt that the existing legislation for the GCSB is imperfect and needs to be improved. But there is no doubt that this isn't the right way to go about it. Mr Speaker, effectively what the government is saying is trust us, we know what we're doing. It's essentially what they're saying. They're saying ignore the concerns of the Privacy Commissioner, the Human Rights Commission, the Law Society, uh, the opposition parties, and just trust them. And I want to uh, set out reasons why I don't think New Zealanders do trust them on this, because there is now a litany of what I think are inappropriate actions by this government which undermine public confidence and civil liberties. Uh, the Honourable Phil Goff went through the appointment of Ian Fletcher, where the Prime Minister had to have the truth dragged from him, uh, uh, initially denying that he knew him when it was proven that he did. Initially, he did. He did. He did. He, he, he said he was a sort of a minor, a person that he might have met once or twice, once or twice. Turned out he went to school with him. He had breakfast with him. He asked him to apply for the job. He rejected the shortlist and then he appointed him. Then, there, and played rugby with him. Uh, Mr Speaker, then he claimed not to have been briefed about Kim.com and it was proven that he did. And then he uh, claims and still claims that Mr English didn't tell him when he was out of the country and Mr English was acting Prime Minister that he authorised the suppression of evidence relating to Kim.com. It doesn't add up. Then we've had the prior exercises of improper use by this government of, of the power of the state against the media. We had the tea tapes, a stunt that was designed to shoehorn John Banks into the Epsom electorate in order to get a majority at the last election. The stunt went wrong. This very public event with cameras there for a stunt went wrong when the, uh, the improper or embarrassing comments by the Prime Minister and John Banks were recorded by a journalist. Now, there were two defences to what happened. One, it was always clearly a public event, and no one was going to convict a journalist for recording that event when they set up that public stunt. Secondly, it, even if it uh, hadn't been public, if it had been private, and I don't think it was private, but even if it had been, if it was inadvertent recording, it was legal. The Prime Minister, during the election, used the power of the state through the police against the media, against the media, and then in the end, didn't pursue it because they knew it would be embarrassing to the government, there would be no conviction entered against the journalists, but nonetheless when they dropped it said, we deem him to be guilty without trial. Then we had the other instance of the serious fraud office uh, raiding the National Business Review and using production or examination orders against them to try and get information about South Canterbury Finance following the inept inquiry by the government agencies. That again was improper breach of media freedoms by the serious fraud office and we and the opposition said let's fix it by the, through the search and surveillance legislation and the government refused to do and even now to this day the serious fraud office has the right to use production orders and examination orders against the media. Then we've had the parliamentary service, then we've had the Sky City debacle where there are improper processes and to this day the government suppresses the advice given by the Treasury to MED, by MED to DPMC, and by DPMC and MED to their Minister, the Prime Minister, still suppressed. Then we've had the ousting of the jurisdiction of the court in the respect of the disability legislation so that New Zealanders can't go to court. Then we've had using urgency for, to curtail people's rights and protest at sea, no select committee uh, report, no Bill of Rights. Rep. We're still five years after the abolition of the Canterbury Regional Council, have got no local democracy uh, in Canterbury. And, Mr Speaker, the government says 
trust us, we know what we're doing. That's why the opposition, amongst the other reasons, does not trust this government and does not think that this legislation pr should proceed. Uh, Mr. I, Speaker. I call Stephen Browning.